Hello again. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is um, tail recursion. So that sort of came up a lot um, last week. Um, and I want to explain what it is. So to do this, I'm going to start off talking about um, just uh, loops in Scheme. I think it's useful to see um, the looping construct as it's presented in Scheme. Then we'll, we'll dive into tail recursion and the impact of tail recursion. Um, and then we'll, we'll just go back to um, revisit Scheme um, a little bit and how Scheme loops are um, really implemented. So the, the kind of joke is Scheme is fully functional. So the Scheme functions, uh, Scheme has a looping construct. The looping construct is really translated into recursive function. But then the recursive functions are translated into while loops. So that's how Scheme deals with loops um, in a way that makes sense for Scheme. All right, so let's talk about Scheme loops. Um, this is a looping construct in Scheme, and this will just go on forever. All right, so um, what are we doing here? Uh, wh one of the interesting things here is that loops have names. So um, the name loop here is not special. We could have used any name. And um, when you say at the bottom in the third line of this code, when it says uh, loop, what that's saying is go back to the beginning of this loop. So it's going to, of course, go back to the beginning. Um, and um, that's a named loop in Scheme. Um, we can also have loops that have arguments, if you like. They have variables, local variables for the loop. So this is a loop with a variable that is modified each time we go around the loop. So the way we do this is we specify um, the variables in this first set of round brackets. And um, they're specified in pairs. So we give the variable name and then its initial value. So what we're going to do here is then uh, write something out or do whatever we want. Um, but now when we go back around the loop, we need to tell the loop how to change the variable that we're interested in changing. So um, this is really going to assign the first variable to be whatever this expression is. So um, the first variable happens to be in, and so we're setting in to be in plus one. So this is going to loop around incrementing forever. Um, so if we actually ran this in Scheme, it would just loop around forever and increment. Um, the, the name loop here is not significant. You could use anything. Um, and it's, it's common to do this kinds of things, say, in you know a function. Here's a function um, that is defined recursively. And um, what I'm doing here is defining uh, the function with one parameter and sort of looping around and now invoking it. So what's the difference here? It, the difference is that a loop um, defines something and invokes itself. So I, I don't have to um, define a loop function and then invoke it. This is immediately invoked. So, um, you know, with uh, global variables, we, we have to deal with um, global variables at uh, top level. So here is a global variable in Scheme. As it turns out, Scheme really is not a language that emphasizes immutability that much. Um, so pretty much anything, almost everything, can be assigned in Scheme. Um, so And the syntax for this is the set bang. So set exclamation point or set bang, um, like bang, bang, bang. So for exclaim. So here we have a loop. And what this is going to do is, is uh, update the global variable. And you may be more used to writing in this style, where we're used to writing in terms of side effects. So um, all that we did in the version with the local variable is um, well, sorry, this is a localized form of the variable. So um, instead of a global variable uh, in here, I have a local variable, um, which is going to loop around. 
And uh, what we've done over here, of course, is to have um, a way of dealing with that without actually having to update the variable. We're doing it as a parameter to the loop. So it's a parameter as opposed to a local, which we have to mutate. So um, anyway, if we want to do things in the style, you know, sort of as close to C as possible, um, we can write out some uh, C or Java code. Uh, this is a imperative version of the factorial function where I'm computing the result here in a while loop and I'm just looping up um, and multiplying all the various values of in into this result and then returning it. Um, so here is a possible definition in scheme where I have a local variable uh, initialized to one and now my loop is going to loop around where um, I actually have a bound on the loop. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting. So rather than writing a bound at the part of the loop itself, um, note that in scheme, uh, there's no implied go back to the beginning. Instead, you have to explicitly say when to loop back. So, um, so what I'm doing here is say I want to loop back at this point. And so typically these looping backs uh, are inside of a conditional statement so that we don't always loop back. If we do, we have an infinite loop. So as, as all the previous examples were. This is actually a function which is useful. Uh, it does something useful. Um, so if uh, in is greater than one, um, it's going to set the result to be the result times in and uh, in to be in minus one and then it loops back around. All right, so that's a, a scheme uh, loop. Um, and you know, in, in, in scheme, it's, it's actually typical that we don't really use these imperative features um, that much. So the more standard way of doing it is to make these local variables um, loop parameters. So here I have the two local variables um, as loop parameters, that's the result in in. Um, and when I want to update them, I need to update them each time around the, around the loop. So I update um, in, uh, sorry, the result here and uh, in here. And so that's the two new values for the two loop parameters. And so that's loops in scheme. Um, and it's, it's just, it's interesting that, you know, Scheme has these things. Uh, you can sort of see that the loops in Scheme are really implemented using recursive functions. So what are you really doing here? You're defining a little local recursive function called loop, and then it immediately just calls it, all right? It calls it, giving it the arguments you've defined here. So um, anyway, that is um, a loop in Scheme. So now let's turn to, um, the concept of tail recursion. And I actually want to talk to you uh, about this in terms of the details of the implementation of function calls. So um, you know, the importance of tail recursion really becomes apparent when you start dealing with the limitations of the machine. So in other words, this is not for um, functional correctness, but rather to ensure that we're using resources in a sensible way. And so we can write functions in many ways. They may be logically equivalent, but they'll, they may use different uh, amounts of resources. We already saw this with Fibonacci function. The Fibonacci function we talked about last week, you can write it in the standard way where we have two recursive calls, one to fib of uh, uh, n minus one and one to fib of n minus two. Um, those calls overlap though, so that function uses a huge amount of time um, to compute something. Whereas uh, we saw if we could write it in a different way, more like a loop, and in that case, um, it took uh, far less time. So, uh, you know, the thing is with computing, we're not just worried about functional correctness. We, we, we do worry about the resources that we're using. Um, so in the case of Fibonacci there, what we were talking about was the resource of time. Um, what I want to talk to you about now is the resource of space. So we're going to look at how much space is required to run a recursive function. Um, 
So I just want to refresh your memory about how functions are implemented in um, most programming languages. So um, what we have is a stack um, of activation records. So an activation record is the place where we put the local variables and parameters for each individual function call. Um, these are also known as stack frames. And the reason that this is called the call stack is because this is where we put um, things related to function calls. And it's a stack because we need to create one of these areas, these activation records, when we invoke or call a method. And then we can remove it when we return. Um, and of course, functions are called in a FIFO uh, fashion. So, or a FILO fashion, LIFO fashion, whatever, last in, first out. Um, so, in other words, if, if uh, A calls B calls C, then C is the first to return, then B, then A. So we go, bup, 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 bup. Um, and therefore, uh, we use a stack in almost all languages. So, um, in practice, you know, we, we like to think that stacks can go on forever, but in practice, they can't. So uh, runtime environments will typically limit the size of the call stack. And um, what that means is that uh, if you keep calling, you know, a thousand functions uh, that call each other, then you might end up running out of space. Um, and this is uh, a problem in particular with deep recursions. So um, let's look at an example. This is a simple recursive function that just counts down. It doesn't really do anything interesting. Um, it essentially returns its result. So um, this function, if you give it x, it returns x. Uh, it just does it um, slowly. So it does it in linear time in this case. Okay. So um, w what we're going to do is for each uh, invocation here, if you invoke with x, if x is 0, we return 0. Otherwise, I'm going to return 1 plus the countdown of x minus 1. All right, so the way this is going to execute is we have countdown of, uh, uh, say, 15. Then we'll go, that's 1 plus countdown of 14, 1, 1 plus 1 plus countdown of 13, etc. on down. All right? um, so you can type this thing in and run it. And in fact, I will go ahead and uh, do that. So let me get to a place. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually running on an Ubuntu machine here. And um, the file that we're looking at is called uh, recursion.c. Um, there it is. That's got the countdown in it. And you know you, you can run this. I'm, I'm actually uh, using the argument from the standard, um, from, sorry, from the command line to, to run this thing. So um, to run it, I will. Um, well, let's just do it for a single value. Um, oh, gosh, whatever. All right, so let's call, let's let's run it for um, you know some some value. There we go. So I'll just run this uh, for a single value, and you see it just <laughs> it doesn't do anything because it's not actually printing the result or anything. So it was perfectly happy. Um, I can I can run it for different values here. Um, you can see that the response is almost instantaneous because um, of the, um, oh, <laughs> yeah, fine. I need to return, I need to turn optimization off, I think. Let's do that. Yeah, okay. Um, the, uh, if you opt, so the, I, I just turned optimization off. I realized I, I was compiling with this with optimization, which is uh, a bad thing in this case because the compiler is smart, smart enough to figure out that this function doesn't do anything but return its argument. Um, so I just took the brains out of the compiler by turning the optimizer off. Um, and you, you can see what happens here is that this works um, for you know some numbers. Oh, it doesn't always work. Right, so yeah, it, it actually runs um, for certain numbers. Um, but I'm getting this thing, segmentation fault here, for other uh, runs. And it's, it's, it's uh, kind of interesting to see um, uh, what happens here. Um, I can run this. I have a little, there we go. Um, 
I'm going to run it on a bunch of different values here. And you can see, it, it's so for some of these values, uh, yeah, this is what, uh, 261,000. Um, yeah, some of them it's working fine. And then occasionally it'll die. And then um, it'll work again, then it dies, then it works again, it dies. And yeah, as you get bigger and bigger, it dies more and more. Um, to where it's dying pretty reliably. Every so often it just works, but mostly it dies. Um, so what's going on here? Well, what's happening is we're running out of space on the stack. And this is sort of dependent upon what's going on in the machine. So if you run it at the same value, um, you know, 100 times, you may not actually get the same result. Um, I'm using some uh, stuff here. This is just the, um, the shell language of Ubuntu and also this will run on a Mac. So seek presents a, a list of numbers between a range and this is just the for loop. And what we're gonna do is print out the number and then call the recursive function. All right, so anyway, that's, um, it's kind of interesting that this uh, dies um, in, in some cases, uh, it works in others um, and there you go. It's kind of interesting. Um, so what, what's happening is that we're running out of space on the stack. Um, the this space that's given to each process uh, for its stack is something that's configurable. Um, it, it is specific to each operating system. It's a very particular number. So it's not um, something, and, and as you can see, it actually can change from run to run in terms of what the behavior is. So it may depend on what's going on on the machine. Um, so there's a, uh, on Linux, there's this thing called ULimit um, that is going to allow you to um, set a bunch of limits. So I can just run this and show you what it does. Um, all right, so this shows you a bunch of system settings um, that it says what you know the system is, is uh, currently configured to do. Um, and, and some of these I can change um, some of these I cannot change as a, as a user. Some of them you have to change as a super user. Um, so there's uh, so-called hard limits and there's so-called soft limits. And um, this shows the stack size. This is the hard limit, uh, excuse me, the soft limit for the stack size. This is the hard limit for the stack size. Um, and you can change these things and that might allow you to run with slightly larger sizes for a while. But eventually, no matter what you do, if you run on big enough uh, inputs, you'll, you'll run out of uh, space. Um, so the story in Scheme is similar. Uh, it depends on the version of Scheme you're using as to whether or not it is actually going to uh, allocate stack frames on a stack, or sorry, I should say activation records. If it, it's gonna allocate those activation records on a stack or if it's gonna use the heap. So certain implementations of Scheme um, won't actually give you an exception they'll just start to perform really, really poorly as you um, use these large um, things. So I, I'm gonna use a particular implementation of, of a scheme called chicken scheme. Um, and the advantage of this is that it's uh, implemented by compilation into C. And so it uses um, C stack frame. So um, here's the same sort of example. And just to show you, if you run this um, for large enough values, uh, you'll get a segmentation fold. So if you're interested in playing around with chicken scheme, um, I got it by installing a uh, chicken. So um, it's not actually called scheme, it's called uh, chicken. And once you get it, you get CSI, which is the chicken scheme interpreter. Um, Java also has uh, stack limits. You may have run into these yourself. Um, so if you, it, you know, it's, a, it's actually a pretty standard thing to happen to um, uh, everybody, all kinds of programmers, beginning programmers, even experienced programmers will uh, occasionally mistype something and end up with um, the delightful stack overflow error. All right, so stack overflow errors mean um, that we've had too many recursive calls and that the recursive calls have bottomed out. Often, for, you know, for beginning programmers, this is usually because of an infinite recursion, but you can see here countdown is not actually an infinite recursion. It is um, a perfectly sensible function. It's just uh, using too many stack frames uh, to compute its result. And so here it's going to die. Um, last time I ran this, it bottomed out around here. Um, this was a little bit more predictable for me in terms of where it stopped last time I did it.
because of Java's predictability. Um, Scala has a similar issue because uh, Scala is implemented on top of Java. Um, so we'll get the same error actually in Scala as we would in Java. I mean, it ha may happen in a different place because um, uh, the Scala, it configures the Java virtual machine differently, but um, you're, you're still going to get this error when you go to a large enough uh, number. <clears throat> so why is this happening? Well, you know, sort of the intuition is, and I've shown you these, these kind of diagrams in class quite a lot, so we have the function countdown, and what happens when we call countdown of five? Well, it's one plus countdown of four. And the problem here is that that addition cannot be performed until countdown of four returns. So what we end up doing is calling uh, countdown of four and three and two and one, and you can see that those additions just sort of pile up. Um, what those correspond to, each one of these little additions corresponds to uh, memory that we need to keep around to, um, to store the values that we're going to use after the function returns. Right? And so you can see here that the amount of memory we need is actually linear in the size of x. So whatever the value x is, um, the, the number of frames that I'm going to need to keep track of corresponds with uh, what x or x plus 1. There's people screaming outside. So, um, okay, so that's what's uh, happening here and why we're running out of space. All right, um, so let's, let's be a little bit more precise though, and I'm gonna do this in C. Um, and to be really accurate about it, I wanna look at the assembly language produced when we actually compile this function in C. All right, so the, the compiler options um, that I'm gonna use here are, I'm gonna use the C99 standard, um, and I'm going to use the minus S option, which means please produce assembly code for me. All right, so um, if you run this, then um, the GCC compiler or, or Clang actually takes the same options, whatever compiler you have, um, it will produce a .s file. So um, you can see it here. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, sorry. Let's copy that. Um, and you can look at the resulting file. This is it. Um, the resulting file may have a lot of stuff in it. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to look at all of this stuff. It's got, um, you know, things we, we aren't particularly interested in. What I want to drill into is the uh, countdown function. So um, the countdown function here is going to look something like this. Um, and it's not important, you know, it's, every little detail here is not super important for us, but look, we have, the, this is the beginning of the countdown function. It does some stuff, uh, sort of the preamble to get itself going. Then it starts doing its computation. You can see this is a conditional, so it's uh, jumping around uh, labels two and labels three, depending upon whatever. Um, but the important thing for us is this line here, where we can see that we're actually doing the recursive call to countdown. Um, so look what happens after the recursive call to countdown. Well, what are we doing? We're going to add one into the return value. Of course, this is what we have to do, right? So we're adding one after the return. Um, and only after that do we actually exit the function. Okay? So that's when we get out. Um, note here, you can sort of, now you see that where we're leaving, um, you can see that the other jump to L3 is in the case that, um, in the case that, um, we did the comparison here with zero, uh, and we found something not equal, uh, sorry, equal to zero. So um, anyway, this is, if it's not zero, it, it jumps over here to L2, does all this stuff. Um, if it is zero, uh, then it doesn't take that jump. It instead uh, puts zero in the return value and then um, returns, okay? So um, either we're gonna end up with zero as the return value or we're gonna end up with one plus the result of the recursive call. So um, this is our source code, right? So where we have uh, one plus the recursive call. And sure enough, uh, after the recursive call, we have one plus in the actual assembly. So um, <coughs> that's what's happening. So what is a tail call then? A tail call is a call that is the last thing that is done before a return, right? So um, this is not a tail call because after the call, we actually do something before we return. So 
um, not a tail call. So what I want to look at is uh, tail calls. Tail calls are uh, swell, and um, compilers can be quite clever about tail calls. So, um, <clears throat> and we'll we'll look at this um, uh, in a in a in a sec. Okay. So um, we'll we'll see this running. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, actually, let's go ahead and run it. So I have this with a tail call here. There we go. Um, let me turn the optimizer off. I wonder what actually happens. Yeah, okay. I, I haven't run this yet this way. So let's um, let's run this with the uh, loop. Yeah. Okay. So without any optimization at all, it's actually still um, bomb bombing on me. Um, I, I can actually do this at low levels of optimization. I think. Let's see if I do this. And um, runs just fine. Okay, uh, let's actually look at the assembly language output. It's it's more instructive to sort of see what's uh, what's happening. But uh, first, let's do it without optimization at all. And and the important thing to note is that uh, here, when I have the recursive call at the very end, the call happens just before we actually get out. So. The only thing we do after this recursive call is we leave. So there's no computation that happens afterwards. Um, so uh, again, you can sort of see the comparison here. Um, <clears throat> this is what actually happens. Um, by the way, if I if I turn up the optimizer, as, as you can see, um, it, it's hard to actually see on this particularly stupid example what's happening because the example is so stupid that the compiler can just completely remove the thing. So when I when I go to high levels of optimization, or actually any level of optimization, it just takes the loop out. Um, and so that's kind of sad. And um, so what, what we'll do is actually we need to look at a more complicated example. So um, let's look at a um, more complicated example of that. Um, and you know, the, the thing that I want to show you is this optimization that can be done in a compiler. And it's a tail call optimization. What, what it means is that um, we can take a tail call and um, not allocate a new frame after the tail call. Instead, we can overwrite the existing frame. So the since, since a tail call is the last thing that happens in a stack frame, this stack frame you know, is not needed ap after, we, uh, after we return from the recursive call. It's not needed. So therefore, we can simply um, reuse the space um, for the recursive call rather than allocating new space. So this is what's called a tail call optimization. Um, all right. Um, so, t so some compilers do this in general for any kind of tail call, um, and other languages uh, do it only for uh, recursive calls. So um, some languages do it only for s functions that directly call themselves, and some fun functions, uh, sorry, some languages can do this for mutual, mutual, rec mutually recursive functions. So that's a function where uh, f calls g and g calls f and f calls g and g calls f. Um, so this previous example is not I interesting enough. So let's let's look at a more uh, complex example, a richer example. This is a linked list where I want to sum the elements of the linked list. And um, what we can do here is look at this version of the linked list um, under heavy optimization. And um, you can see here that the recursive call is simply optimized away. So. Um, again, the source code is written in a recursive fashion, and and when we actually um, run this or optimize it, um, the the recursive call is completely removed. Um, note that this has still got to loop. So unlike the the previous the stupid um, countdown method, this one actually actually needs to go through the list to figure out what the values are. So the the compiler cannot figure that out. And so it actually does need a loop. So you can see here is a uh, loop, which is going around uh, checking the value uh, of a pointer and um, uh, continuing until we hit null. 
So this is uh, checking for nullity. So it's just uh, checking whether RDI is zero. So RDI is holding the pointer. Um, and what we're doing is um, getting the value of the element stored at the pointer, advancing the pointer, uh, checking the pointer. Um, so we're adding this into EAX. So we're accumulating our result. So we add the value there into EAX. We move the pointer. We check whether it's null and jump. So we're going back and forth. So this is exactly sort of the, you know, what you would expect for the fastest way to actually sum up a list. So, um, so Scheme uh, does tail call optimizations. Um, it does it for uh, uh, all functions. So um, and this is what, what they call proper tail call optimization. It's actually required for the language. So um, it, what it means is in Scheme, if you have a tail call, you'll never use any extra space. So tail calls um, don't accumulate on the stack. And in particular, that means for recursive functions, they don't accumulate on the stack. So um, this is something that's required um, also in later versions of uh, JavaScript. So um, if we look at um, Let's see if I can find this. Uh, yeah, here's my um, JavaScript um, compatibility table. Um, you'll see one of the things that are, is uh, required in ECMAScript version 6 is the first element actually is called proper tail calls or tail call optimization. Um, so this is something that is expected to be in any uh, ECMAScript 6 or ES6 uh, compliant browser. Um, you know that actually you can see this is the compatibility table. Um, Apple's Safari is uh, currently pretty much the only browser that does this. Um, so this is uh, Safari and different versions of WebKit. Um, pretty much the other ones aren't doing it yet. So, um, <clears throat> but they should do it eventually. <laughs> Okay, so um, anyway, this is the proper tail call optimization uh, for JavaScript. Um, it also happens in implementations of Scheme. Um, okay, so here is a uh, list. Um, and um, what, what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to talk to you about whether or not, um, you know, we can tell that Scheme is, is doing this or not. And so in, in order to do this, I need a, a big list. So um, here is a function called um, long list. And um, what it's going to do is create a big list for me. So um, let's create a big list here. And um, I'll, go, I'll do this in chicken scheme. Right, so there's a, a function called long list, and now I'll call that function. Um, and you can see it's uh, that's long list of three. Um, let's do long list of four, and you can see every time I call long list, it sort of doubles the size of the list. Um, so I can define um, some variable to be say long list of uh, 20 and um, that will construct a list for me and now I can find the length of that list and you can see here that's uh, a million elements so I now have a million element list so in fact that's just exponential growth so we have an exponentially long list um, how are we doing that uh, what the code does here is it says um, if in a zero just give me a list with one element that's the singleton uh, one Otherwise, um, recursively call uh, long list on n minus one and bind that to the variable sublist. Then um, create a new list where I copy uh, sublist twice. Right? So I'm um, <coughs> going to copy that out twice. Note that the time uh, that it takes for this is actually linear in n. So it's proportional to the size of the result. Excuse me, I should say it's linear in two to the n. Okay, 
excuse me, it's uh, exponential in n because it's going to take us um, that much time to create this thing. But it's linear in the size of the result. Um, so that's about as good as you can do. You know, it's, it's going to take us a, a million little units to create a list of a million elements because we have to create those million little con cells. Um, but um, this is actually a pretty performant uh, function, and it's, it's nothing like our Fibonacci um, disaster. This is actually running pretty quickly here. Okay? Um, and the key here is that I'm using this local variable declaration to call only the recursive function only once. So we're only doing the recursive call once. Um, and then um, doubling the size at every call. Um, is this tail recursive? And the answer is no, because um, here's the call to long list. That's the recursive call. And you can see after that, we're doing stuff. Yeah, we're doing stuff with the result of the recursive call. So anytime we do stuff with the result of a recursive call, it's not a tail recursive function. Um, but this function doesn't actually take that long to run. In fact, you can think about how many invocations of the function we need. Um, so we're, we're just going to end up doing a linear number of invocations. So, um, you know, for in in. So if in is 20, we're only going to call this function 20 times, um, or 21. And um, it's just that the list that we're generating are getting twice as big. So we start off with a list of length. Uh, one, then two, then four, then eight, then sixteen, etc., all the way up to here, um, a million. Okay, um, and yeah, it, it's worth pointing out that without the sublist variable, the performance gets quite dreadful, um, and we're in another sort of Fibonacci-like world where um, we're not going to do a linear number of calls to the function; we're going to do an exponential number of calls to the function, and um, sadly, it will then take. A huge amount of time. All right, so uh, because we keep rebuilding these lists rather than using the shared lists. Okay, once we have this thing, um, we can write uh, a tail recursive sum and then sort of call it, and everything will be hunky dory, I hope. So here's my uh, tail recursive uh, sum function, and um, let me just call that thing on my long list um, so I can call it. And you can see it, it, it actually works great. It just goes through and adds everything up. Um, if I try to call the non-tail recursive version of sum, um, make sure this is the last thing you do because it kills the chicken scheme interpreter. So um, I can try calling this on the list um, and the thing just chokes and dies. Okay. So what happened? Well, we ended up creating too much space. Um, and in, in C, of course, C is not very safe. So the reason it dies in a segmentation fault is we overflow the stack. And so we've gone off into some part of memory we really shouldn't be accessing. And therefore, um, the operating system halts the program. So sad, 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 sad. So. We can play the same game in Scala. So this is um, a Scala function for creating um, a long list. And uh, this is an exponentially sized list. And we can then, of course, write the sum function in the two ways that we wrote it in uh, FP1. So here's the tail recursive form. And um, when we do that, of course, we get um, really nice, quick performance. Everything is fine. Linear time, wonderful. Um, and it's worth pointing out that um, in uh, Scheme, excuse me, in Scala, um, there is a optional annotation we can put on a tail, recall, tail recursive function that actually uh, tells the compiler that we think that this function is tail recursive, and Scheme will actually check it for you. So if you're curious to know, you know, is a scheme function tail recursive, you can just, excuse me, Scala function tail recursive, you can just type it into Scala with this annotation. If it's not tail recursive, Scala will complain. Um, so here's a function that's not tail recursive, um, and I'm making a claim that it is. Um, and if you get this, Scala will um, give you an error. It'll say, I'm sorry, that's not a tail recursive function. Right? Um, 
So that's uh, how we do this in uh, Scala. Uh, and of course, if we, if we try to compute the normal sum function on a list of a, a million elements, what's going to happen is we're going to get a stack overflow error, a Java stack overflow error. All right. So anyway, that's um, all about tail recursion in, uh, um, in these languages. So we actually talked about Scheme, C, Java, and Scala. They all have sort of the same stack-based um, thing. So it's, it's kind of amusing if you go back to the concept of uh, these um, Scheme loops. So um, these loops in Scheme are all guaranteed to be tail recursive. So that's the whole point of the syntax is that it forces you, when you loop, that means you're always going back around, okay? So um, the loop form in Scheme is a way of writing a tail recursive function and immediately invoking it. Um, and that is how um, that works in Scheme. All right. Um, so maybe I'll stop here, this segment of the lecture, and when I come back, um, we'll be talking about uh, Scala's object-oriented features. Okay, so I'll see you in a minute.